Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, last of the breakfast meetings sponsored by the Center for Real Estate at uh, uh, the University of California, Irvine, Mirage School of Business. My name's Ed Colson, and it's a great pleasure to host for the Center to host this panel today. Um, the Center for Real Estate uh, remains active even during this uh, uh, lockdown time due to the COVID-19 and UCI campus closure. All of our in-person events and professional programs have been postponed. We think most will be rescheduled just as our classes in today's meetings. We may offer some more stuff for you in a virtual format. But the real estate program at, uh, at UC Irvine remains healthy. We had 12 MBAs earn their certificate in real estate this quarter. Uh, enrollment in the real estate classes is as strong as it's ever been. And I know from personal experience, because I'm teaching two of them online. Um, hopefully in the audience is Tom Sherlock, uh, who this uh, quarter is teaching our capstone course. Um, Tom's been a great supporter of the center uh, for, for many, many years. And his capstone course is a highlight of the program. We've had a lot of guest lectures from the industry. Uh, in our classes this quarter, uh, David Kim, Jim Pugh, Carter Powell, Brooke uh, Bircher Gustafson, Aaron Hill, or just the people, or just some of the people that have been in my courses and have been supporters of the center for many years. Um, we've got uh, uh, great student organizations that are remaining active during this uh, time period, both the undergrad and graduate student organizations have held many online activities and it's been a real treat to see them carry on during this time. Uh, a, a big highlight of this particular quarter is um, uh, some of our best MBA real estate students have been working with the uh, chief investment officer for the University of California Regents. Uh, the, the, the CFO came to us with a request to get some of our brightest minds involved in repositioning uh, the real estate portfolio that the regents hold. And so they've been working with a $200 billion uh, real estate portfolio. It's been, it's been great to see that. Uh, news from the Mirage School of Business, if you had not read this in the local media, is that we have a new dean coming on board uh, January 1st. Ian Williamson comes to us with a very, very interesting background. He, is currently Dean at uh, the University of Wellington Business School in New Zealand. He is, he is an American uh, and had his education and his early uh, career was in the US, but he went overseas for several years and has risen through the uh, Australia and New Zealand academic ranks. And I'm, I'm personally very excited for him to join us in January. Some thanks, uh, Kurt Strassman, who's not on our panel today, but uh, who has served as the chair of the center's breakfast meeting series over the past two years. Uh, Kurt's also uh, been a frequent guest lecturer in our courses and was in Tom Sherlock's course that I just mentioned. Want to give special thanks to this meeting's planning members, Tim Guyman, Joe E. Lopez, Sean Ross, and Tom O'Rourke, Ryan Kennedy, Matthew Otteson, Bruce Fisher, and... Um, my managing director at the center, Sharon Nakamura-Brown. Also our team members, Eddie Carranza and Aaron Collins for, this, for their critical work in facilitating and supporting this, our first Zoom uh, webinar. Uh, and a special, very special thanks to uh, this year's breakfast series sponsors, Tal Invest Capital, Haskell & White, KPMG, Snyder Langston, and Waterford Properties. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Bruce Fisher, uh, who will introduce our panel speakers. Bruce is the chair of the West Coast Real Estate Practice and co-managing shareholder of Greenberg Traurig's Orange County office. Uh, Bruce is very active in the community, serving on a variety of nonprofit boards, including the Center for Real Estates, and uh, has helped us out tremendously over the past couple of years. He's chaired several of our annual board meetings and is frequently invited to speak and write on real estate prop topics. Bruce, take it away. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. Um, first, I'd just like to welcome everyone to our breakfast meeting. Um, unfortunately, unlike our typical breakfast meetings, we're not able to serve you any breakfast. However, <laughs> as a trade-off, you get to watch this program in the comfort of your home, own home probably. I'd like 
with a, a cup of coffee in your hands and, and maybe a much better breakfast than we'd be serving. Um, I'd like to note that I did get dressed up for all of you today as I'm wearing a dress shirt, which is a bit different than the workout clothes I've been wearing for the last 10 to 12 weeks. Um, uh, before I get started, I too would like to thank all of our sponsors as well as all of our planning members that Ed already mentioned. Um, I especially want to thank Sharon Nakamura Brown, the managing director of the UCI Center for Real Estate, for all of her efforts, of course, in organizing all this, because without her, this, this wouldn't happen, of course. Um, although I've planned a number of programs for the UCI Center for Real Estate over the last couple of years, I must admit that this is my first time in terms of planning a program like this virtually. Um, now we're standing some of the challenges in doing so, quite frankly. Um, but I'm told that we've got over 165 people that actually registered. I'm not sure if they're all on watching this, but there was pretty good turnout in terms of, of people actually. Um, so, you know, given that, it's a testament to all of the efforts <coughs> and all of the uh, others, uh, all the other planning members as well. Um, our program today will actually be in two parts, actually. The first part of our program will uh, focus on PPP loans and some of the issues and challenges in obtaining PPP loans and qualifying for loan forgiveness. Uh, it should be interesting when we have that discussion. Uh, the second part of the program will focus on the issues that must be considered as the economy opens, which is happening now, and people return back to work, um, as well as a variety of landlord-tenant perspectives to be considering going forward. Um, one point also uh, for question and answers, we'll have a question and answer thing at the end, and you can ask your questions by hitting the Q&A icon, I think, at the bottom of the screen, and then I'll try and uh, point in the direction of the, whichever panelists the question is for. So now I'd like to briefly introduce um, our four panelists. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce John Drachman. John's the co-founder and president of the commercial division of uh, Waterford Property Company. He was responsible for the firm's commercial division and capital raising activities involving office, retail, and apartment assets all over Southern California. Uh, prior to founding Waterford, uh, John was a VP with Green Law Partners in Orange County, and before that, he was a commercial real estate broker with uh, well-known Greb and Ellis. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Charlie Hobie. Uh, he's the Managing Director of Product and Operations for EQ Office, uh, with more than 25 years of experience in the real estate, strategic consulting, uh, and operation fields. Uh, Charlie is responsible for all facets of property management, including engineering, construction, and property management, and property development for EQ Office. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce, introduce you to Thomas O'Rourke. Uh, Tom is a tax partner with Haskell & White with over 25 years of experience in public accounting. Uh, prior to joining Haskell & White, Tom worked for both national and local CPA firms, including uh, Ernst & Young. Last, and of course not least, uh, Todd Wolfson. Todd's the managing partner with Orange County Office of, and Todd, I apologize if I don't get these pronunciations exactly right. That's okay. <laughs> Carruthers, Decente, and Friedenberger, hopefully I was close. Um, uh, they're a California-based labor, employment, and immigration law firm with offices throughout the state. Uh, Todd you know, focuses on focuses practice on counseling and defending businesses and labor and employment matters for over 30 years. And Todd and I have actually been on a couple of these programs where Todd's been speaking of labor and employment issues. Um, so with that, I think we can get started on the first part of our program. Um, so first we're gonna, Todd, why don't you tell us a little bit about the PPP, and you know, sometimes I go PPPPP, so I have to stop at three Ps. Uh, the PPP loan <laughs> program, as well as the forgiveness and how all that, how all that works. Sure. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I get to talk about free money, which is always uh, good for getting people's attention this early in the morning. The, uh, the Payroll Protection Program, the PPP, was designed by the federal government to get money quickly out into the economy and uh, hopefully uh, discourage employers from uh, firing or laying off uh, too many of their employees. Uh, it, was a, it was a great boon to uh, thousands of, of employers, uh, and now the issue is if they can comply with the requirements, they can get up to 100% of the loan that they receive forgiven. Uh, whether that's a you know, $4 million loan or a $40,000 loan, they can get it forgiven. So the, the, the two most important things to keep in mind in terms of getting the loan forgiven is the most important person in this process is your lender. 
Uh, you probably have a lawyer, you probably have a CPA, you probably have people that are advising you, but at the end of the day, the lender is the one that's gonna have to review your application. They're gonna have to audit all of your information and they're gonna have to submit that to the Small Business Administration. If the SBA decides that uh, the application is appropriate, the SBA will then refund the money that your lender gave to you, so the loan's forgiven. Uh, any disparity, uh, the SBA is simply going to hold that extra money out and that uh, immediately becomes a loan that you have to pay back at a ridiculously low interest rate of about 1%. Uh, but still, if you can get free money, why not? Uh, the second most important thing to keep in mind is the fundamental purpose of the PPP is to get money to employees. So if you think about that in terms of everything we're talking about, the goal here is to get as much money in the hands of employees as possible. The two big issues with respect to the loan forgiveness are going to be uh, the headcount uh, and then the, and the way that the calculation is done. Uh, since uh, I purposefully went to law school because I'm not good at math, I'm going to leave all the calculations to my colleague Tom O'Rourke. So I'll be talking about the, the headcount issues. Uh, but the, the loan forgiveness, uh, the amounts that can be forgiven are payroll costs, uh, interest on mortgage obligations, rent, and utilities. We're going to break that down in a little bit more detail. Uh, but that's kind of an overview of what the PPP loan is designed to do is you can get loan forgiveness on those those costs and payments if you complete the application properly and the SBA approves it. I, I mean, uh, Tom, did you want to uh, add anything to that or go to our next topic? No, I think we can go to the next part. Okay. All right. So, Tom, you know, what about, you know, what are the limits for the forgiveness of the costs and payments? And what's the 75% 70 rule I keep hearing about? How does that all that work? You know, should people be, be you know, focusing on that? Well, absolutely. Uh, the 75% the rule, you know, generally you're presuming that you have the eligible costs that uh, Todd was speaking about earlier. Uh, and essentially those costs are made up of payroll costs and the rent utility payments, interest on mortgage obligations. and the, the discussion that people have is that, you know, you hear 75% needs to be of payroll costs. Uh, but the terms actually that uh, you cannot exceed 25% of the loan forgiveness amount with these other eligible costs that they're talking about, interest, rent, and utility payments. Uh, so you could work through the calculation and the 75% portion is your payroll costs, which include health insurance, retirement contributions, uh, limitations throughout, but, but generally that's what it is. And then the final rules came out to clarify that the 75% payroll requirement does not mean that there's no forgiveness if the payroll cost is less than the 75%. What you essentially do is you get your qualified payroll cost and you divide by 0.75 and that brings you to the gross amount that could be forgivable, obviously limited to the amount of your loan. And, and so you look at those components and then and the other conversation that I hear people, because most of the people that ask me questions, they say, I hear about the 75%. What does that mean? And then the very next question out of their mouth, probably because of what I do, the next question is, well, is it all tax deduction? Do I get a tax deduction? Is it, how does it impact my tax? Uh, so to the extent you have a forgiveness item directly in the CARES Act, that item is non, it's excluded from income. Uh, so that, that's a great answer. You don't have income if you get forgiveness. The next step in that process is, well, I've paid all these eligible expenses and they were ordinarily deductible for my business. Well, the IRS came out after the CARES Act was issued and said, hey, we want to issue some very expedited guidance to give you an idea of what we see the rule as. And they said that to the extent you have forgiveness, you're not able to take deductions for that amount of the forgiveness. The Senate and the House both came out and said that's not the spirit of the law. Uh, so they intend to try and write that with a technical corrections bill. It hasn't been approved yet. It's at the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, but ideally what will happen at some point is you'll have a deduction for paying these items and you'll have an exclusion, which would generally create a tax benefit to the owners. So, so that's, it's in and flux. We'll still have final regulations, but essentially the forgiveness is excluded from income. Currently, the way the IRS reads it, your expenses would be eliminated so that you can't generate a loss. So it would be in more of a net zero. However, you gotta look for the technical corrections bill to come out in the future. So that, that's sort of the nutshell of the forgiveness of the 75% rule and its tax impact. 
All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Tom. Todd, anything to add to that? Yeah, just in a nutshell, the question I keep getting from clients is they, they keep thinking that they have to spend 75% of what they received on payroll. And as Tom just pointed out, that's, that's not the calculation. It's you take the amount you spend, it's, you take the amount you spend on payroll, and that is then your basis for everything else. So, so Todd, you know, how does the employee headcount, how, how, how does that work? I mean, it seems to me it's pretty simple math to just count it, but I know it's not that simple. I mean, so why don't you share that with us a little bit? If it was simple, you wouldn't need accountants and lawyers at all, and then where would we be? Um, the, the interim final rules from the SBA came out on May 22nd, so this is all being interpreted kind of on the fly there. For those of you that want to Google it, uh, just look for the SBA interim final rules on uh, payroll protection program forgiveness. It's 26 pages long. It's a, it's a fun read. Um, but the, the primary issue on the headcount is the most important numbers are the number of employees you put on the PPP application uh, a couple of months ago, and the number of employees you're gonna put as your headcount on the PPP loan forgiveness application. Those numbers need to match. Uh, and the SBA is, is gonna be concerned with the number of employees. They're not gonna be concerned with the names of those employees. So if you've had some turnover and you've replaced them or whatever, again, the, the goal here is to get as much money out to employees as possible. Uh, they're looking at full-time equivalents. So those are people that are working roughly 40 hours a week. If you have people that are working part-time, basically the SBA is gonna take everyone that's working part-time and, and assume they're working half-time. So two, two part-time persons becomes one full-time person. Uh, but again, the headcount is the application versus the loan forgiveness application. Those numbers need to match and if they don't, there's a sliding scale of how the loan forgiveness uh, is lost based on the, the loss of headcount. Bruce, you're, you're muted. Here we Bruce, go. Yeah. That, I, I see it, thanks. <laughs> um, so Todd, what about the limitations on the reduction of headcount? So you, you fill out the application, you do it correctly, you've got the right headcount, it's all right. And then there's some sort of reduction. What happens then, Todd? Um, it, that's a good question. Uh, if, if you start reducing the number of employees, you start reducing the ability to have the loan forgiven. Uh, and uh, again, it's 26 pages long, so I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but suffice it to say that for every person that you eliminate, uh, you're gonna get a pro rata reduction in the amount of loan forgiveness. So it's extremely important to maintain that uh, relative headcount. Uh, so that you can maximize the loan forgiveness. And, and the loan application does not have you put down the names of all your employees, particularly if you've got hundreds of them. You know, if you put 180 employees down, uh, the SBA is going to look, be looking to see that you have 180 employees that are going to be returning to work uh, and, uh, for that loan forgiveness period. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more later about it, but uh, the fact that you may have to lay off employees later or you may terminate employees you know, a month or two months from now, isn't terribly relevant. It, what matters is the number of full-time equivalents you put on the loan forgiveness application that is approved by the SBA uh, within 60 days, and then the SBA funds that money back to your lender. Uh, that's the headcount that you worry about. Uh, Tom, any, anything to add to that? No, I think we'll get back on track on the next one. Uh, okay, let's, let's go to the next a, item then. Yeah, um, got so, a lot to cover. Yeah, so, so what are the limitations <laughs> on an employee's comp? Uh, also, what happens if their comp is one thing when you start this process, but then there's an increase at some point? I mean, how do you deal with, with those issues? Yeah, since the payroll crusts are the defining moment in all of this, that you're limited to your 100,000 of comp per individual. Um, <clears throat> you, so you can include hazard pay, uh, bonuses, normal commissions, normal things that happen. So you can move through there. But it's essentially $100,000 of annualized comp per year. So they'll look at that. Um, the rule states that compensation paid to owners, because there's more questions regarding the owners uh, and the people over $100,000. You're limited to uh, a gross of $15,385, uh, which is their essentially eight weeks of the period that the loan's supposed to cover, divided by 52, comes up with that amount. So that, that's how you're getting there, but it's the lesser of that amount or your 2019 comp applied by the same ratio. So there's a couple different rules in there to keep you on track, but the idea was that this loan and the forgiveness component of it is related to people earning $100,000 or less 
or limit you to that hundred thousand dollars general partners because uh, we have a lot of partnerships in real estate and uh, of course in law firms and in real estate uh, accounting firms, but the partners are limited to the 15385 or the less lesser of 850 seconds of their 2019 net and self-employment income. So that's a different calculation. So you got to check with your advisor on how you're getting there. And probably in the next few weeks, because your, your loan forgiveness form is going to have to be filed with the bank during June. So those are the kind of things that are moving. Um, but, but essentially, if you keep in mind that people earning under 100000 all in are going to be covered and part of the forgiveness and then limit everybody else. All right. All right. So, so Todd, you know, <clears throat> what if an employee refuses to return to work? I mean, we're hearing a lot about, you know, offices and retail and other things are starting to open up now, of course. And, and we're hearing a lot. Some employees don't want to go back to work right now for a variety of different reasons. And so how does that work if you've applied for the loan and you're supposed to have these employees working, but they don't, they, they don't return to work Health yeah, issues or other issues. That becomes a huge problem because obviously the head count needs to stay the same. So if your employees are not coming back to work, that could, uh, you know, materially affect the amount that you get forgiven. Uh, and it's probably one of the, the number one issues now kind of being circulated on blogs and, and articles that I'm seeing employees are refusing to come to work for three basic reasons. They've either, they believe it's unsafe to come back to work. Um, they're scared to death to come back to work or they otherwise have childcare or have moved on or whatever, or whatever the issue is. Um, the, the analysis, or the easy way to avoid that is um, if an employee is raising an issue saying, I don't think it's safe to come to work. You need to investigate that and make sure they don't have some kind of credible claim because refusing to return to work could become an OSHA issue and you don't want to be deemed to be retaliating against anyone. But assuming the workplace is as safe as it's going to be, uh, there's the California Department of Public Health has issued guidelines on every different industry on what you need to do to make the workplace safe. If you comply with all those things, you're good. Uh, if they're scared, um, now you've got a Americans with Disabilities Act or a Fair Employment and Housing Act issue. There actually is a potential perceived disability or an actual disability for employees that claim that they have this uh, unreasonable fear to return to work. In those instances, the best thing to do is ask the employee to provide some kind of a note from a healthcare practitioner uh, and have uh, a, an interactive dialogue to see if you can come up with an accommodation. Uh, if both of those things have taken care of and the employee uh, childcare moved on, they simply can't return to work. The most important thing to do is you wanna get a, a written notice out to the employees, preferably a letter, but you can do it by email as well saying, look, your job is available at the same salary, the same hours you had before, uh, and please let us know by a date certain if you're gonna be accepting this position. Uh, if they don't accept that position or if they reject it, keep all this documentation because if you've provided that letter to an employee and they refuse to return to work for whatever reason, you don't take a hit on your headcount. Uh, there's actually a, a part of the, of the form to the SBA uh, of you offered the position, an unconditional offer of employment to this employee, they turned it down and it won't uh, affect your headcount for purposes of your loan forgiveness. It's a, that's a, a very important issue in this whole thing. All right, so Todd, it's for a follow-up. So people or going back to work, hopefully, um, and they have gone back to work. And then something happens where, for good reason, an employee has to let someone go, or the employee just quits. So it's another sort of nuance in terms of your headcount. How does, how does that work? Yeah, again, you got a balancing issue. I mean, the employer obviously wants to get loan forgiveness, but they don't want to keep an employee around that may be doing, engaging in misconduct in the workplace. Keep in mind, California Labor Code 2922 says that any employment not being for any specified term is deemed to be at will. So you want to preserve that at all times. You don't want to be sending out notices or letters to employees saying they have to be terminated for good cause. However, the SBA, again, uh, with a federal overlay over California law has said that if an employee certainly resigns or if they're terminated for a, a good cause reason, uh, then that employee, the, the loss of that employee is also not counted against you in terms of headcount. But I would advise in that instance to have you know, qualified HR investigator or have a, you know, a labor attorney, someone advise you that, yes, the reason you're terminating this employee uh, complies with the SBA's guidance so that uh, you can, you can maintain the headcount because you don't want to be just, you know, laying employees off uh, for no good reason and then try to, to claim them as part of the headcount because you'll, you'll lose a percentage of the loan forgiveness. All right. So, so Tom, switching back to the accounting part of all this, yeah. Um, what happens if the loan's not forgiven? I mean, what's the result of that? I know it's not good. Yeah, well, there, there's two things. If they determine you're not eligible, 
uh, then the SBA will notify the lender, the lender will notify the borrower, and then you have to repay it. Uh, there's potential for penalties and things like that. Um, but if, if it's normal circumstances where, hey, you just, you didn't qualify for uh, a lot of forgiveness, you have to still repay the rest of the loan. The balance on the loan uh, must be repaid on or before the two year anniversary of when the loan was made. And it's at a 1% rate, so it's a pretty good rate. Uh, if you've made payments in the middle and then you're forgiven, they'll, they'll come up with an amortization schedule in, in order to accommodate that. So it's, it's, not, it's not outside the box. It's very much what you would expect. All right, Tom, when, if you conclude all this, so we've all been hearing about this $2 million, this safe harbor, the $2 million threshold. And, and, and some people may think that, look, if you're under the threshold, you just don't have to worry about anything. You're, you're home free, there's nothing to worry about. I know that's not true. So maybe yeah. tell us a little about that. And then uh, Todd, when Tom finishes, maybe you want to add something to it. Maybe you've got some, even some good stories to tell. So go ahead. Well, there's a couple different things. The, the SBA uh, sort of changed gears on when you, when you filed the application, somewhere in the application, you signed on that said you made your application in good faith. Uh, subsequently down the road, uh, they came back and said, well, you know, everybody heard about Shake Shack and Ruth Chris and all those things. And they said, well, that, that's not really our ballpark. We weren't supposed to be doing that. They had other access to capital. So they changed the certification. Um, and then everybody that was an outrage at how can I project out my certification of behaving in good faith and projecting a new standard of need. So then SBA was actually pretty fluid with it within a week, came back and said, okay, if you're under $2 million, we're gonna presume that you signed in good faith. So therefore you're under $2 million loan. There's a presumption that you acted in good faith. However, they can come back in and look and still determine because they're gonna audit everybody who borrowed more than 2 million. So if you took less than 2 million, it doesn't mean they won't audit you. It just means that they're determining that you acted in good faith. That's a good thing. So then you have to walk through the lines. Yeah, you know, uh, make sure you have your file supported with contemporaneous documents of how you supported the loan application. What were your payroll costs? Maintain all that stuff for six years. Make sure your lender has the information they need, but that also other people at your company have the information. If it's tied into one, one accountant in the corner and that accountant wins the lottery and leaves, uh, nobody's going to know where that is and you might have to defend it for the next six years. So make sure you have a good system in place to maintain that documentation. And then if they come in, support it. Todd, uh, any thoughts? Um, sure. I'm just going to give just kind of just a general thoughts on the, on this whole, whole process with, within the PPP is um, the, I think the three most important things are things that I am seeing that people are doing that are getting them in trouble uh, is the, the way they're handling the recall. Uh, the way they're handling uh, PPE uh, with their personal protective equipment, uh, and then the way uh, they're doing the notices to these employees. Um, there's a whole lot of information out there. Uh, you, you can't turn on the news. You can't look at a, a news site without seeing some new opinion as to you know, how to properly recall your employees. Uh, but keep in mind, we're in California. Uh, this is the worker's paradise. This is the most litigious state in the nation. So California law, uh, when it butts up against federal law, uh, if, if you can comply with both, you have to. So think, you know, eight hour workday versus 40 hour work week, you have to comply with both. So the fact that you've got, uh, you know, you see a news report in South Carolina or Texas to what they're doing doesn't mean you can do it in California. And very briefly, uh, you know, I have a, a one client that decided that they were listening to Governor Newsom's uh, broadcast about 65 year, uh, 65 and older employees should really stay home. So they sent the notices out to all of their uh, employees saying, we want all of you to come back unless you're over 65. Uh, we're not sure when you're going to be able to come back. Uh, please stay at home, uh, which is overt age discrimination. And of course, their opinion is, no, Governor Newsom said that's what, first of all, Governor Newsom doesn't articulate law when he does. He was, it was a recommendation. Um, so keep in mind that, you know, have whatever your recall notice is and whatever your plan is, have that reviewed by counsel. Uh, another issue is if you're in Los Angeles, I'm sorry. Um, there's not, <laughs> Los Angeles is not going to be open until there's a cure, according to Mayor Garcetti. And Los Angeles has all of its own rules with respect to how to recall employees. You have to do it based on seniority. Uh, LA has a lot of its own rules. Like right now, the restaurants are opening back up, um, not necessarily in Los Angeles. Salons are opening back up, not in Los Angeles. Uh, if you want to have some kind of a temperature check program or something bringing these employees back, have that reviewed by uh, a competent HR person or a labor lawyer. A lot of people are just having you know, some employee back in the warehouse take temperature checks uh, that does not comply with the law. You're probably going to run afoul 
uh, three or four California and federal laws by restricting or sending employees home because you think they had a fever. And the reality is all you got to do is chew on a couple of extra strength Tylenol and you can beat that test anyway. Uh, and the final issue is if you are required to have your employees wear PPE, so gloves or masks, you have to provide that to them in California. And you have to provide that to them either disposable uh, that are OSHA compliant and you have to show them how to use it and train them to do it properly. I have a, a, an employer uh, that called me up and they said, we got this terrible problem. We asked all of our employees, you know, they're required to wear a mask. So we, we sent them a do-it-yourself mask kit on how they could take a t-shirt from home and make uh, a, a face covering for it. And one of the employees while working on the manufacturing line used an old t-shirt and it was so tight on his face, he passed out into the, the, the line. Um, and you know, he's, he's okay, but uh, he's got a pretty good bump on the head. Um, that doesn't work. You, you can't just tell employees wear a bandana or wear a t-shirt uh, mask. If you're required to give masks, take a look at the OSHA guidance on that, provide surgical masks, disposable masks. You don't need to give N95, those respirators, but something other than uh, a piece of cloth they put over their face because that really isn't gonna help anybody with anything. Uh, but whatever your plan is, have it reviewed by uh, you know, so senior HR person or competent labor counsel, make sure you're complying with California law as well as federal law. All right, well, well thanks Tom and Todd. Thank you for all that discussion on PVP loans and other related items. I think we're gonna switch our focus now um, and talk about some considerations that we have to look at with folks going back to work, um, landlord tenant type issues, and that'll be John and Charlie now. So we'll, we'll sort of switch to the next part of our program. Um, so, uh, John, why don't you have you started off and what sort of steps are you taking in terms of your business right now, uh, to open up the commercial properties and, and what are you guys doing? Yeah, thank you uh, for having me today. And I appreciate uh, being a part of this panel. Um, you know, we have about a million and a half square feet of office assets, uh, throughout Southern California. Um, and obviously it's been, you know, this kind of hit us out of nowhere. So it's been challenging. So, you know, we've, um, gotten really, um, I would say, uh, proactive with all our management and engineering teams to look at all our buildings, talk to our tenants and figure out the, you know, the best ways to try to make our buildings, you know, candidly, I would call it healthier. Um, and so that includes, you know, we've ordered hand, sanit hand sanitizing stations, which before we just have in the lobby. Now we have outside every one of the elevator banks and all our buildings. Um, you know, we've been going through uh, and getting uh, upgraded air filters. So um, I never thought I'd learn what the different ratings of air filters are, but through this crisis I have. So we've been going to more hospital grade air filters in all of our buildings uh, just to try to do, deal with the recircul recirculation of air, uh, which we think is obviously, um, you know, based on research, could be a major factor uh, in how COVID spreads. So wanted to make sure that we have the highest quality air filters that we can have. Um, you know, we've been looking at things in elevators. That's been a big concern. Um, you know, is there ways in which to do, you know, copper buttons, things of that nature in elevators? Um, so, you know, we've really been trying to go through with our teams and look at everything within our buildings, all the major touch points, uh, everything we can do from a cleanliness standpoint um, to really identify, you know, where are those problem areas um, and then figure out how to improve it as much as possible and then communicate that to our tenants. Let me ask you a quick, quick question, John. What are you doing in at your buildings in terms of requiring tenants and their invitees when they come into the building in the common areas and or the elevators to any requirements or stated requirements for wearing uh, masks? You know, we're following the guidelines that uh, are given by the state or the municipalities that we're in, um, which can be, and we'll talk probably talk about that later, different. Um, you know, I think that we're not requiring masks to come into our buildings unless it's a requirement of the municipality that we're in. Um, we have talked about um, something that Todd mentioned uh, in a couple of our buildings of whether we provide temperature checks to all the employees as, uh, as they come into the building. Um, you know, our, some of our attorneys have concerns on that. So, um, you know, uh, so to answer your question, I, I think at this point, um, the answer is no, but, you know, that could change. Um, you know, what, what's difficult for us as a landlord, and I'm sure Charlie will talk about this as well, is, you know, we're not the em employer, right? We, we just have the space. And so the concerns that we have is 
what are the potential lawsuits that we could get from people saying, I got COVID-19 because I was in your building. Um, so we're trying to mitigate that or trying to do our best to make our buildings as healthy as possible. But, you know, it's, it's, we're on sort of high alert right now, um, given everything going on. Bruce, I think you're on mute. I am, and thank you. <laughs> uh, no so worries. Charlie, so, Charlie, um, what's what's the hierarchy of controls that, that you guys are implementing? You guys have a lot of office buildings you know, all over, so I suspect you've got quite a bit of you know things that you're dealing with. And then maybe talk about that a little bit, and at the end, maybe tell us what you guys are seeing in terms of your offices, whether you're requiring the face coverings in the common areas and elevators as well. But, but go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. So for for us. Uh, yeah, we have around 20 million square feet of office across the country, and we have, uh, you're, you know, we're in markets that have, we, we prefer to call it re-entering the office, because, you know, versus, as opposed to reopening. Our, our, our uh, you know, multi-tenant office buildings have remained open in, in every jurisdiction, and, you, and so now we have, uh, you know, Nashville and Denver and Las Vegas, uh, you know, some markets are coming back early. Boston comes back next week, and I think it's important to take a step back and, you know, creating a low risk environment for, you know, transmission of the virus. And the primary method that the virus spreads is through moisture droplets that you emit when you breathe, cough, sneeze. So you go outside on a cold day. This is, the, this is the best way I've heard it described. Go outside on a cold day and that, that mist that comes out of your mouth, it doesn't travel, you know, across the, the uh, you know, the room. It goes about three feet. And so that's where the physical distancing guideline comes around six feet. That's a minimum, right? So if you can be better, better than six feet, then that's, that's, uh, you know, even, even better. So, but that's, that's what we're trying to, to prevent. And so you talk about the hierarchy of controls is, is the way that we approach it. And it's that, that the, the tiered list of things you can do to prevent the spread of the virus. And all of them are important. We're doing all of them, but the hierarchy starts from continuing to work from home. That's why we're doing it. If you can split shifts, you know, uh, you know, as, a, as an employer, do, continue to do that, uh, you know, until there's a, um, uh, a cure or, or herd immunity. Then, then once you're, if you, if you come into the office, physical distance, so that beyond six feet, the events by your spaces, we're putting in traffic control so people don't have to, you know, come in within six feet, one way enter, one way out of the lobby, et cetera. The third thing to do is personal hygiene. Wash your hands, don't touch your face. That prevents the surface transmission. But then the fourth, which was the topic before, is facial coverings. Facial coverings, we're requiring them across our, our entire portfolio. It's important. It doesn't protect necessarily the wearer. It's not PPE, but it protects the environment. Again, we're protecting the environment from those moisture droplets that come from your mouth. And then we're also increasing our frequency of cleaning high-touch surfaces. There's a list on the EPA website of there's like 100 different chemicals that will clean, kill the virus. It doesn't have to be some you know, exotic chemical. So we're, we're doing that, increasing that, that and, uh, high touch surfaces. And then we're also working, as John talked about, uh, enhancing building air quality, bringing extra outside air, upgrading the filters. That, that, those combination of things that we're doing in, across our portfolio, and I think most landlords are doing, the, our, our health experts and, and health experts in general, I think, will say that an office environment is a low risk environment for transmitting the, the virus. All right. All right. Thanks, Charlie. So, so, John, what are you guys doing in terms of your continued lease off operations? It's got to be a little bit different now, and it's completely different than it's been in the past to be able to, you know, you still have space and you're looking to lease it up. So, how are you guys handling that? And I'll let, you know, Charlie, let you chime in as well after John finishes on his perspective on that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been challenging. You know, one thing I think um, from, a, from a positive aspect, I think that's gone on with this has been. Some of these things in terms of making your buildings healthier, I really believe we should have been doing um, more so. Um, you know, I should have been more on the forefront of understanding the air filtration systems in our buildings and what level of air filters we were using. And, you know, we have one project where uh, we've owned it for a little bit uh, of time and we are now just signed a contract to go to all touchless um, fixtures in the restrooms, right? So, um, you know, sinks, hand, you know, uh, soap dispensers, that was technology that's been around. We should have already been implementing that because I think at some point we get over COVID-19, but I think it's important to know that having your employees be healthy, having the people that are working in your building be healthier, if they can be more productive long-term, I think there could be some benefits for what we're going through because there's a lot of landlords who are figuring out, okay, probably should have been doing some of this stuff anyway. So I, I you know, 
I know this is somewhat of a negative time, but I, I, I always try to think about things with somewhat, somewhat of optimism. And I do think some of the stuff we're going through, I've learned a lot. Our company's learned a lot. And I think it's some stuff we'll just keep within our portfolio and keep doing. So I, I think that's an important, important thing to note that I think some of these things will actually benefit uh, the office environment uh, over the long term and the, the tenant experience. Regarding new leasing, um, you know, it's been really challenging. We had really good momentum in our portfolio. We were about 87, 88% leased going into this. So we feel good that we're pretty well leased across our commercial portfolio. But the issues we've had is, you know, new leasing activity has been really, really slow. We're just starting to see new tours um, pop up. Um, you know, we have a, a, a variety, like Charlie, a variety of different types of office assets. Um, you know, we have a couple high rise buildings. We have some low rise assets. Um, I would tell you the activity within the low rise space uh, in terms of new activity has been greater because I think there is a sense that people feel safer in an environment where, um, you know, we own a building in Irvine uh, that we reposition where it's literally we have three standalone buildings. We have a, a vacant 15,000 square foot building where you can walk in. We can build a restroom within that space. And we have a number of tenants who are looking at that building right now because they like the idea of their tenants park, walk into a building, they control their restroom, they control their environment, rather than going into a common area, a lobby, corridors, uh, using common area restrooms. So I, I feel like that's where we've started to see the new activity. So, um, but we've implemented, you know, 360 um, uh, videos of our spaces, um, you know, trying to make it so we the, the, we were grouping tours, uh, so we know when people are coming to try to you know not group them together. Um, but you know, anecdotally, it, it's been really light on the the new tenant activity. Charlie, uh, what's what's your experience? What are you guys doing to to make all this work with these changing times? Yeah, the, it's similar. I mean, the, the touring activity has been has been weighed down. Um, you know, we are doing you know, some things with technology to you know provide the uh, you know, virtual tours. Um, you know, and the other thing is just you know requiring the the tour uh, groups to uh, you know follow our you know physical distancing path of guideline or path of travel uh, you know and facial covering guidelines. I do want to pick up on something that that John mentioned as far as it relates to. Um, uh, building indoor air quality. There's, a, there's an interesting you know, kind of public policy debate that's going to play out, which is there's a tension between having a building that's really energy efficient and one that has a lot that, is, that is, has you know, high indoor air quality. So if you talk about bringing in a lot of fresh air, that's additional air to condition, that's additional electricity cost. So, the, you know, this, the, the, we, as we, like John, you know, we, we ended up studying and learning a lot more about our, the, you know, our air filtration and, and outside air percentages in our buildings. It turns out that buildings that were built in the, the 80s or so are much better at, at combating uh, you know, or providing more fresh air and, and, uh, uh, than, 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 you know, buildings that are, uh, you know, might have been more recently built that are lead platinum. So um, I, I think that'll be an interesting one to, to uh, conversation from a, from a real estate uh, perspective to watch over the, the coming years. I, I, I would I would echo that too. I mean, sorry, Bruce. I was just going to say there's a couple of the properties we have where we've had to upgrade our air filters based on the HVAC quality, um, and we've actually seen that the newer HVAC units we actually haven't been able to. They don't have the power to handle some of these hospital grade air filtration systems. So I, I completely agree with Charlie, which is it, it, it's there's yeah, there's going to be a balance there. Right. So, so Charlie, how is it working with dealing with local and state municipalities and with the reopening process now? That's got to be a little bit of a challenge too, uh, especially, I know you've got buildings all over, so it's different everywhere, quite frankly, in terms of how each city and county and state, quite frankly, are handling things. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's very, the navigating the, you know, myriad, uh, you know, health laws, guidance, you know, occupational, occupational health uh, laws and uh, across the, our, you know, various markets is you know, very complex. Um, you know, we've got the advantage of, you know, having ownership in, in Blackstone that's, you know, very uh, engaged in this kind of stuff. And so, and we have the resources to you know, to hire, uh, you know, outside, uh, you know, folks to do our, you know, public relations and research and, and marketing and, and the various different, uh, you know, what's going on in various municipalities. And, and frankly, we just, we rely on our, our local team. So our 
general manager in, in Nashville is, you know, on top of what's, uh, you know, what's required there. And, uh, you know, they have certain percentages, 25% of the folks could come back in their phase one and 50% in their phase two. And, you know, they, they do have to do, it's one of the few uh, markets where they are requiring uh, temperature uh, scans uh, by employers. Um, so, you know, that's, it's way too much for, for me or someone central to keep track of. So we've got a, a whole, uh, you know, team of folks working on it and it has been very complex. John, what's your experience been? I mean, the same, and we're only based in Southern California. And I would tell you that we're experiencing the same thing because, you know, fortunately all our properties are under the same state, but we're finding that counties are different. Cities are different. Everything's been different. So it, it has been challenging because it, it feels like there's no comprehensive um, sort of rule book. Um, and so we're, we're, we're doing the best we can. Uh, and just, again, with just trying to think about, you know, how can we be the best landlord? How can we make our buildings as safe and as healthy as possible? But, you know, some of it is us just doing these things, right. Um, and, and, and trying to be proactive with it. Uh, and there's a nervousness that, you know, we have in, with our investors just of, um, you know, are, are we, again, is somebody going to get sick and then try to blame it on us because they got sick in our building and we didn't follow all the proper protocols. So we're trying to document everything and, and, and provide these guidelines, but it, it's, it's challenging. It's a certainly challenging environment to be a landlord right now. All right. So, so, so John also, so what are your, tele, your tenants telling you when you're talking to them, maybe you're getting calls, maybe even new tenants you're talking to, what do they need? What do they want when they're looking at the building, either existing ones or new ones? And I'll go back to one of the questions I asked originally, which is, and are they asking about what the building is going to require of the tenants and their invitees when they come, i.e., are they going to require them to wear masks in the common areas? Are they going to require them to wear masks in the elevators? Or can people just go in the elevators without masks? And what happens then? What are they saying? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I, I think, I'll be honest, I mean, one of the things, one of our brokers who led a tour said that the first a tenant asked him what level of air filtration systems we have. Uh, and what is our air filtration system? And we've never been asked that question before by a tenant uh, ever on a tour. So I think they're really talking to us about, you know, how are we cleaning our building? You know, what's the protocols, especially in the common area restrooms? Um, they're asking questions like, do you have touchless sinks? Do you have touchless soap dispensers? Um, you know, what's your air filtration system? They, they really want to know about, you know, cleanliness. I think anecdotally what we've seen is a, cu a couple of our tenants, we know because they've had to reach out to us, is that they are redoing their spaces. So they're going in and creating, you know, more uh, areas for social distancing, um, taking out some cubes, implementing new cubes. So that has been going on. So I think a lot of tenants are being proactive um, in, in doing those things themselves uh, and reconfiguring spaces. And that, that's, um, we can talk about that later, but it's gonna be interesting how all this impacts office demand going forward. And Charlie, I know that you guys have done some some surveys actually with a number of your tenants. I'm curious what, what you're seeing with that and also share what, what you guys may be doing in terms of the, the face masks as well in your buildings. Yeah, so the a few comments here. So um, we, we did as, as far as, you know, our, uh, you know, tenants re-entering the, the, their offices uh, you know, in, in larger numbers, we did a, did a survey, we had about 500 responses and it wasn't, you know, a typical, you know, list of things that they're concerned about. It's, you know, they're focused on surface cleaning. They're focused on, you know, other, you know, folks maintaining the, the physical distancing guidelines. Um, and there are, there are, you know, anecdotally, there are a lot of questions about the, uh, you know, indoor air quality. Which, which again, I mean, I'll go back to my, you know, my, my prior point of how the virus spreads. For us, that's that's it's partially a communications issue, right? I mean, we're doing the we're doing the things that you know you would to to improve air quality in the in the uh, in the building as far as you know outside air, increased filtration, um, you know, making sure the relative humidity is is uh, uh, you know um, in 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 line and balanced. And then also there's, you know, those other things like, you know, UV, you know, cleaning uh, filters, things you can do that we're, we're also looking at. But all that stuff is further down in the hierarchy of control. So, you know, that's the, 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 you know, it's important to do, but the, that's not the way that the main way is what we know right now, the main way the virus spreads. Um, you know, we do the, um, as far as it relates to, to elevators, 
I mean, uh, and, and wearing facial coverings. I mean, again, if you're, if you're doing all the things we talked about, uh, you, you know, an office is a low risk environment that includes riding an elevator. So if you're, if you're wearing a facial covering, you're not in the elevator for that long. Uh, you know, the air, the all elevators are, are negative air pressure. So I mean, it's, a, it's an education process for, you know, the, the, the risk of, of contracting the virus in an elevator, if all those things are true, is, 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 uh, is low. And so, you know, we are requiring everyone to wear facial coverings. Not everyone's doing it. You know, we're not like, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the mask police, but we are, you know, politely requesting that the, the uh, tenant visitor to wear, if it's a visitor we require it, but if, if the tenant refuses, we're politely requesting they do it. If not, and if they refuse, if it's in a jurisdiction where, uh, it's required. We we uh, you know politely ask their employer to enforce it, and you know on the occasions where it's not, then you know we we make accommodations. Or some people are are uh, you know if they're if you're medically uh, you know unable to wear a mask, then we'll make an accommodation as well. Obviously in that case, so find them a, a you know private elevator or, or a freight elevator or or uh, you know try and somehow get them to a uh, their their space through a physical distance uh, method. Right. And Bruce, I'd just like to add one thing real quick is that, you know, when we talked about municipalities, you know, we haven't had any of the municipalities or any government officials come to us uh, or have seen, hey, we need to go to touchless sinks, we need to go to touchless soap dispensers, you need more hand sanitizing stations, you need to look at your air filtration, you need to upgrade your cleaning. I mean, there's been guidelines that are out there from, you know, various health departments and the CDC and whatnot, but... Um, you know, I think a lot of landlords are just doing this proactively. Um, and so, you know, I, I just haven't, we're doing it because we think it's the right thing to do and we want to get ahead of it. But, um, you know, it hasn't been, we haven't seen any requirements of any of this stuff. All right. All right so, so Charlie, um, how are you seeing tenants changing their space needs or how their spaces work either asking you to do it or they're doing it or with new tenants they're asking it to be changed given what's going on so what are you seeing out there well well first of all i mean the, there's very few uh you know tenants making a decision right now i mean to the extent that possible everyone's looking for flexibility so you know not making any you know long-term decisions um and, that, and then similar to what you know john said if you do uh you know as you are re-entering or if you are you know you are in the process of planning a space most of what we've seen is, you know, uh, occupants are, you know, making, you know, kind of temporary adjustments. So if they, if they have, uh, you know, just providing for physical distancing, um, you know, having people, you know, some people continue to work from home in their space. Um, the, the biggest, you know, most prominent example, we probably have, we have a full floor uh, technology tenant in, uh, in Seattle who's, who's in the middle of a space plan right now. And they've got the, you know, full on, uh, you know, bench seating open area. They're moving forward with that plan. They're just gonna. They're not. They're not gonna populate those those bench seats, uh, you know, for the for the for the near term. But they're they're not changing their design. They're they're building it out as it as it is, and uh, you know, just kind of physical distance in that space. And then again, as uh, there's a uh, vaccine and you know herd immunity, then they'll 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 plan on repopulating that space. So that's kind of the the most prominent near term example we've got. John, how about you? What, what do you what are you saying? I think uh, pretty much the same. I don't. I don't see necessarily a lot of tenants making, you know, major long-term decisions right now. Um, you know, any renewals that we've had or we've been dealing with right now, tenants have all wanted shorter-term renewals, trying to figure out, you know, what's the world going to look like in a year or two, three years, um, and then commitments on the the long-term basis. I think companies are, you know, trying to deal with and understand what the fallout in their business is going to be through this. Um, you know, one, one thing I would add, um, you know, uh, and be curious to get Charlie's thoughts, but, you know, across our portfolio, rent collections for both April and May were really strong. Um, and so that part has actually been really comforting uh, and good to see. And I think the PPP funding helps help with that because you can um, use uh, part of that funding if you are able to get it to um, uh, pay utilities and rent. So um, that part has been strong. Um, it's just that the new activity uh, has been really, really weak. Charlie, what have you seen in terms of your, your, yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, 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 um, we, we've seen good success in the PPP loan program. Um, and our, our collections have been, I mean, the, you know, the, the publicly available comps are, you know, 90, 95%. We've on the office side, 
uh, you know, we've been kind of in that, in that band as far as, you know, tenants who continue to pay. Um, there's, you know, other, you know, uh, tenants have had other, other sources of liquidity as well. So we've, we've been pretty, pretty fortunate on our, our, uh, you know, tenant partner businesses have, have withstood the, uh, you know, the, the pandemic pretty well. There, there are a handful of exceptions, you know, we've got, uh, you know, for, from an office standpoint, you know, we've got, uh, you know, kind of on, on one hand where we've made, made some, uh, you know, accommodations, but, uh, you know, across a thousand tenants, it's, it's really the exception. That's good. Um, all right. So, so John, um, so this is the million dollar mm-hmm. question and for both you guys, and I'll start with John, of course. So John, what do you think the demand looks like for the different product types, you know, hotels, power centers, um, office, I know Charlie, you'll, you'll want to weigh in on that apartments, single family residential and industrial. What, what are your thoughts on those product types in terms of what's going on? And it's a, I know it's a mixed bag depending upon the product type. Yeah, no. And, and so our, you know, our portfolio is mostly uh, commercial with a little bit of retail um, that sort of service, you know, retail for our office buildings. Um, and in large part, when you look at our rent collections, I just mentioned, if you look at who's not paying rent, it's those retail tenants that are in those office buildings. We have a 24 hour fitness, in one of our office buildings, you know, they're not paying rent. Uh, dentists, uh, optometrists, but, you know, service-related companies. Um, we had Specialties Cafe in a project. Unfortunately, they just shut down all 50 locations last week. So really unfortunate. You know, in terms of demand, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's interesting. Obviously, hospitality uh, has gotten hit first. Uh, and, you know, the occupancy numbers across the United States have been really terrible. Um, I, I think you're starting to see some anecdotal, uh, you know, numbers come out on leisure uh, type travel hotels that are seeing better occupancy. Um, I heard some numbers come out about Scottsdale from Memorial Day weekend uh, in the Phoenix area that were much stronger than what people were projecting. I've heard that here locally too. I think the nature of business travel um, is gonna be really interesting going forward, especially with everybody figuring out how to use Zoom uh, and it being, I think, an effective uh, medium to meet and talk to people. So. I would be nervous about those business hotels or those large convention style hotels. I think that demand's going to be, uh, could struggle for a bit. Um, obviously retail, I think is going to be tough. Um, you know, I think it's going to be, you know, certain retail is doing fine. Some retail, you know, we're continuing to see, uh, it feels like every day you're hearing about more retailers that are declaring bankruptcy and are going to shedding bad locations. We're obviously, I think 24 fitness is going to declare bankruptcy. I don't think that's much of a secret. So, um, Retail is going to be tough. Uh, you know, anecdotally, I think what a lot of people are seeing, what we're hearing uh, is industrial, I think, um, is going to be strong. I think where industrial is struggling right now is in those incubator spaces, incubator properties, uh, where, um, you know, it's smaller industrial, you know, more entrepreneurial companies. I think that could struggle. But, you know, the big box distribution centers, I mean, Amazon, um, you know, UPS, FedEx, Walmart, Target, I see all of them growing. Um, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of the medical supply companies uh, growing as well, which we're hearing. So it feels like there's going to be a rate of adoption to buying online, which actually the United States was behind Asia and Europe. And we're basically doing what was we everybody anticipated was going to take five to seven years. And I think we've com- compressed it in about two or three months. And what I mean by that is, you know, my mom is now using Amazon Prime. She's now buying groceries online. She's now doing things that she wasn't doing before, right? And so I think there's a rate of adoption of that that's going to hurt retail and benefit um, uh, industrial. I personally think single-family residential is going to come out of this great as people are consuming their homes more and recognizing that, you know, your home is a, is a powerful asset that you want. Uh, I think urban apartments are going to struggle um, and suburban apartments, especially that are renovated and have more space, could do well anecdotally within our port apartment portfolio, we are seeing that. We're actually seeing still good leasing activity on renovated apartment units that we have. Um, We're having to get creative with rents and concessions, but there's still activity in that. Um, So that's what I'd say there. And then I'll let Charlie get his thoughts on, on the office side. So yeah, that was a that was a really good macro view. Where cons- our view is, cons- I'd say our you know the Blackstone invest in across product type view is uh, consistent with that. I mean, maybe I'll go deep in office. I think the you know the the future of office is you know kind of out there as one of the the biggest unknowns because this whole work from home, uh, you know, uh, whatever phenomenon. 
And I mean, our, our view macro is that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, talk about, you know, collaboration tools and people are using Zoom and, and whatnot. I mean, the, you know, the, the best collaboration technology, you know, in, in our view and has been proven is the office, is the office space, right? And collaboration drives innovation that drives business success. So, um, you know, we, we, you know, long term are believers in, in uh, you know, folks are going to return to the office. And, you know, the conventional wisdom or there's a lot of provocative, you know, kind of statements about, you know, everyone's going to work from home, uh, you know, the, you know, the whatever CEO of Morgan Stanley and, you know, Facebook and um, are coming out and, and saying, saying, you know, people can work from home. The, the you know, our view is that the, the, the golden era of work from home, you know, kind of tapered off like two weeks after the, the stay at home orders, you know, came, came into play. I mean, you think about what happened was, uh, you know, everyone was forced to work from home or for, forced to stay at home, right? Everything was closed, bars, restaurants, uh, you know, there's no sports being played, you know, so no, no distractions. Um, you had everyone was, uh, you know, rightfully concerned about, about losing their job because, you, you know, now we're at 40 million layoffs. And so, uh, you know, there's nothing else to do. And so, you know, surprise, productivity went up. Um, you know, in, in hindsight. And so, you know, now as you know, the, you get, and, and not only that, but the, if you think about what people were doing, you know, two weeks after I have to work from home, I, I can just keep kind of doing what I was doing, right? Cranking out spreadsheets. I'm dealing with the, the pandemic. I'm, you know, maintaining the business is easy to do or easier to do if you don't have to, you know, collaborate with your, your employees or your coworkers. You think about, uh, you know, what it takes to, to make decisions, to innovate, to develop new business lines, to market new products, all that stuff is way harder to do over Zoom and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, working from home, hire a new employee, you know, expand, you know, do an acquisition, right? These things can't, can't be done from home. So, so, so anyway, as, as the, you know, as people, the further away we get from that two week golden heyday, um, you know, we think it's going to be more and more important for, for folks to come back to the office and, and collaborate and, uh, and we think that, uh, you know, the things that we're doing to, to make that possible and, and low risk are, are going to, you know, uh, help to accelerate that process. All right. All right so, so John, and, and I'd only like to add, I, I agree with that. And the one thing I'd add is it feels like we've all been playing defense the last two or three months. Um, I say that and Tom and Todd are probably laughing, saying we've been working, never working harder with this PPP and all this stuff going on and all these employment issues. But a lot of this kind of feels like, you know, for us, you know, we're not looking at new acquisitions, right? We've sort of stopped that for right now. So everything we're doing is defensive. It feels like it's easier to work from home, as Charlie mentioned, when you're in a defensive position, um, putting spreadsheets together to chart how much you've collected rents and things of that nature. But when we go, I, I just think about what we need to do to go buy a property. We've got to go tour it. So we've got to get out of the house. I can't tour it through Zoom. I've got to go see it. You know, all the steps that go into rehabbing or redoing a property, touring it, meeting with your investors, touring lenders through it, touring, you know, third-party property consultants, doing spreadsheets, working with your team, going through a closing to try to coordinate all that. You know, when we're together, it's really easy. You know, we, we, we couldn't do that all being apart. It would be really difficult. And so I just think because a lot of us have been playing defensive, it's easier. But, you know, once we start going offensive, it's almost impossible for us to work as our small team to work together just via zoom and conference calls and whatnot. It's just really hard. Yeah. And so I, I completely agree with everything Charlie said. All right, thanks, John. So, so John, do you, do you see any special opportunities in any spe special areas, you know, secondary and suburban markets? You know, what are you seeing some maybe opportunities now with what's going on? You know, the silver lining on the cloud. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I we, we talked about, this, we were chatting is that I, I think that, you know, this crisis, in some ways has put rocket fuel on certain trends that were already happening, right? The, uh, the e-commerce trend, this was a trend that was going on, right? If you look at the rate of adoption in Asia and Europe, it's closer to 30% of all, you know, retail sales are via e-commerce and the United States was like 14, 15%. You know, we're accelerating that trend to go higher. And I think that, you know, some of these retailers, um, you know, it, they were already struggling. I mean, JC Penney's has been struggling forever. Macy's has been struggling forever. All this did was, put acute pain on problems and, and accelerate certain trends. Um, you know, that being said, I, I do think, um, you know, one major trend that was happening that I do think is going to shift. Um, and I, 
I don't have the, you know, the full evidence of this. This is just kind of what I feel is uh, the suburban markets were out of favor coming out of this downturn and the urban markets were very heavily in favor. Um, and I think that goes across product types. I could see this cycle benefiting the suburban markets, specifically markets like Orange County, Phoenix, uh, Salt Lake City, Denver, you know, Austin, Nashville, um, really well um, in that, you know, certain markets like LA, San Francisco, you know, New York, uh, getting hurt from this because I think, you know, um, you know, those, I, I think people might view themselves and specifically the millennial generation of saying, you know what, buying that house in the suburbs, it was really cool living in LA when I can go to all these cool restaurants and I didn't spend that much time in my apartment. But when I was locked inside my apartment, it sucked. I want a house with a yard, especially if you have young kids. So I, I could see this trend happening. I think we're going to uh, watch it. Um, we've always sort of trended in more suburban markets, but I sort of believe that those markets would be in favor. And by the way, markets like Phoenix, Austin, Nashville, Denver, Salt Lake City, these markets actually were in favor the last couple of years. And so I don't, and traditionally you would think going into a recession that those markets are going to get hit first. Um, what's funny, like Phoenix, the market we have a partner in now, their rent collections have been grossly higher than Southern California on the apartment side. Um, there's a number of companies, um, you know, DoorDash la late last year took 350,000 square feet of space there to move some employees from San Francisco. I, I, that was already happening. I don't see that trend dissipating. I actually see it increasing. So that's what I think from a, a, a trend perspective. Uh, and as it relates to office, I think that'll benefit suburban office locations uh, more so than potentially urban office locations. Charlie, why don't you, uh, we'll, we'll finish this part of the, the discussion. Why don't you let you Yeah, I, I'll just be brief. And yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're macro investors. And from an off, office standpoint, we still like, again, you know, uh, markets with good, uh, you know, intellectual capital with, with uh, uh, you know, technology-based, uh, employment-based, um, you know, tend to be, you know, more, more coastal markets. Um, we are, we obviously, you know, own a, made a big investment in, in Nashville. So we are, we're monitoring some of the, you know, more the kind of emerging uh, uh, markets as well. You know, one of the things that we're tracking, I, I agree the, the, you know, CBD versus suburban, um, you know, demand is, is one that we'll be watching closely. Uh, you know, especially how, how urban, uh, you know, retail uh, you know, fares after the, uh, after the, the uh, you know, office reentry. If, we do we do believe on you know just back on the work from home we do believe that it will be you know kind of more on an ad hoc you know uh, uh, you know opportunistic um, basis and so you, you probably will see lower density of office workers in some of these urban hubs and what's that what impact does that have on the on the surrounding retail is something that we're gonna we'll, we'll keep uh, keep watching um, you know the other thing we're looking for is you know maybe some uh, increase in the you know hub and spoke strategy where you've got you know companies that are uh, you know, have a lot of exposure to, uh, you know, mass transit and, uh, you know, will they, will they look at that in, as far as they, they make their, their next uh, office decision? Will they, you know, not, not put all their eggs in one basket in a, in a, in a downtown area where they're, uh, you know, risk at uh, disruption by, by mass transit. So those are some of the things we're, we're tracking from a office macro investing perspective. All right. Thanks, Charlie. And thanks, John. Before before we go to our question and answer, and we do have some questions that we'll, we'll address in a minute, I'd like to just mention to everyone that's you know, participating in the program, you know, just to be aware, there's this, this bill out there, Senate Bill 939, um, which relates to it relates to landlord-tenant relationships. It in some cases allow, you know, restricts landlords from further, you know, evicting tenants, and this is from a state perspective. Even when even tenants that aren't paying rent, and then also it allows certain tenants to potentially renegotiate their lease terms. There's a bunch of things in there. Again, it's a bill that's pending. Um, we don't have time, of course, to talk about today, but people should be aware of, and they should be following it because that could have an effect on both landlords and tenants going forward. And and John, I know you've been involved with this a bit, quite a bit actually. So mm -hmm. let's take just one or two minutes, give your quick thoughts, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Um, so I've gotten involved on behalf of NAMP SoCal. Um, you know, the first quick thought is, uh, you know, getting involved with this, what I can tell you is uh, NAOP SoCal, all the major trade organizations that support the commercial real estate industry have really come together very quickly to um, 
provide their input uh, to uh, this legislation and that it's already started to get watered down from when it first came out due to the pressure that um, we've been putting on. I would encourage everyone on this call. Uh, I know NAOP SoCal has sent emails out with letters that, uh, template letters that people can write um, to their, uh, to the senators that are co-authoring this bill to their local senators. I would encourage everybody to, to do so because that voice, it's clear uh, up in Sacramento, our, our voices are getting heard on this issue. Um, and, you know, I think that it's still working its way through the system. Um, you know, the good news is that it's already started to, the, the first inclination of it was, I think, really poor legislation. I think it's gotten better. Um, I, I think it's still got a long ways to go, uh, you know, if it does pass. But um, I, I think it's something that all of us need to be aware of. Uh, take very seriously. The good news is, is that I think people are. Um, and, you know, sometimes these things come up where you hear about a bill and people within our industry will be like, somebody else will deal with it. Don't do with it. You know, I, I don't need to worry about it. You know, this is one where it is, it, we all need to take this very seriously. And I think that we, we as an industry, as a commercial real estate industry, uh, have to continue to come together. And, and people on this call, I would encourage you, you know, to write those letters uh, to the various uh, stakeholders and the people that, you know, people have suggested. Um, and if, if you don't know who it is, you can reach out to NAOP SoCal and they can very easily get you this information because it's important that our voice is heard on this because the, the legislation could dramatically impact the tenant landlord relationship uh, far exceeding COVID-19. Um, and it's, it could have a lot of unintended consequences that could be very detrimental to our business. And transparently, very detrimental to uh, tenants as well in terms of how we would securitize leases going forward. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. So let's go to the question and answer part of this. Um, got a number of questions. I think maybe Todd, maybe you'll, you'll, I think you can maybe take this first one. So there was a question. Can you comment on the liability to employers when reopening regarding the fact that Newsom has put the liability on the employer if someone gets sick? The liability costs are viewed by many companies as is too high to you know are high so uh, what are your thoughts on that uh sure yeah i think that that's true i think uh governor newsom has has intentionally put a lot of the liability on employers kind of I break it down i mean right now even if your county and your city is open uh and you're able to return your employees state guidance county guidance everything is still recommending that employees uh telework whenever possible uh the reason for that is is if they're teleworking obviously they're not uh, in the office, there's not a social distancing issue. Um, the, the federal government, when they passed the Family First Coronavirus Response Act and then the extended Family Medical Leave Act, put the onus on the employer to pay for employees that couldn't work because they were symptomatic or taking care of someone or had child care issues. Uh, Newsom has done an overlay on that that has kind of dramatically increased the cost, and that's really respect with, with workers' comp. Um, back in 2009, 2010, when swine flu came out, there were thousands of cases brought by employees saying, hey, I got swine flu from the workplace. It should be workers' comp because I don't have insurance or I don't have good insurance, whatever it was. Uh, and the, the end result of all the litigation was it was impossible to prove uh, where you got the, the virus. Uh, same thing's going to be true now. You're not going to be able to prove that you got it at the grocery store or you got it at the office building or anything like that. So what Governor Newsom did is they said that if you recall employees, if, you're, if they're not teleworking and they're in your uh, workplace and 14 days later uh, or thereafter, they get COVID, it's presumed to, that they got the, the COVID-19 from the workplace, which means it's a workers' comp event. And for those of you that don't know, your workers' comp uh, cost each year is based on your last year's expenditure. So it's your experience modification rating. So if you spend... $10,000 in 2019 on the workers' comp, your premium for 2020 is gonna be at least $10,000. What a lot of the insurance companies have done now is they've said, we're gonna pull out of California completely, uh, or we're gonna be anticipatorily increasing the costs uh, by a factor of four or five uh, to all of these uh, employers. And many of them are gonna be reverting over to the state fund, which is you know the kind of the fallback for the state, but the state fund is gonna go bankrupt on this. And we're, we're talking five, $6 billion in increased costs if the anticipated number of people uh, make workers' comp claims uh, related to COVID. Uh, and then the other issue uh, that's California-based is, as I mentioned before, kind of the PPE thing. Uh, California Labor Code 2802 says that 
anything that's necessary for the employment has to be provided by the employer or reimbursed by the employer. So if you have a local law or the employer uh, requires that uh, gloves or a mask be worn, that has to be provided by the employer. Uh, they have to pay for the cost of it. Uh, it has to be provided in compliance with OSHA guidelines. Uh, Cal OSHA has come up with a specific uh, guideline on, on how to handle the, the mask and the gloves. Uh, and you have to show the employees how to use them and how to use them properly. And then most importantly, you have to figure out how to dispose of them because providing a whole bunch of surgical masks to employees isn't, isn't that good if they only get one uh, and they have to make it, make it last a week or two weeks. Uh, you're going you're gonna to be in violation of California law for doing that. So, uh, and, and I think, you know, Governor Newsom has uh, been, you know, outspoken about that. Uh, he, he wants to put the onus uh, on the employers uh, because they're the ones that are, uh, have the most control over the employees in terms of where they work and what they're doing. But again, the, the whole incentive is to keep employees working from home as long as possible. All right, thanks, Todd. I've got another question. Maybe, maybe Tom, you can tackle this one. It says, what is your view on smaller public companies being eligible for PPP loans? Yeah, well, remember that the issue that came out was uh, Harvard, Shake Shack, and Ruth Chris were the big three. Harvard had a $40 billion endowment. Shake Shack's market cap is $2.3 billion. Uh, and even Ruth Christ's had a $300 million market cap. So, so they were talking about companies with substantial wealth uh, and, and a smaller public company that doesn't reach that level still has to go about uh, proving their need if they're above a $2 million loan. If they're below a $2 million loan, they don't have to prove their need. It was done in good faith. Uh, but there is that gray area because they did come out in the uh, frequently asked questions, the SBA release that, you know, if you're a public company, a large public company, uh, you might have those issues. So you got to, how well can you document that there's a need? And if you do that, I think you're fine. Um, but clearly, if you're in that range of Ruth Chris all the way up to uh, Shake Shack, uh, there, there's a public perception that's going to come in and hammer you on, on that. And that might become the bigger issue is, uh, are, are you defaulted out by public perception? So somewhere probably below 300 million, uh, but still able to uh, prove out a need for the loan is where they'll fall. All right, great. All right, so I think our, our last question, I think, and this will be guessing we'll see. Um, maybe both you, John, um, and Charlie, maybe Charlie, maybe you go first and then John. Um, how likely is it that there will be a there will be conversion you know, conversions of distressed retail properties, strip, especially strip centers um, or hotels, to other uses, i.e., industrial multifamily? So again, a change in terms of the use based on what's going on. Any, any thoughts, Charlie? Yeah, I'll I'll start. I mean, again, we're we're mainly uh, office investors, but the yeah, I, I think there's probably going to be some change in uses. I mean, this is this is something that is consistent with John's comment before, uh, right? The you know large um, you know regional malls were you know kind of not on such you know, great footing uh, before before COVID, and so yeah, you know what to, what to do with all that that space is definitely going to be a, a question for. Uh, you know the, the communities and, and businesses in those in those markets. Um, you know we have we've seen it even in uh, you know some of the uh, infill uh, retail in in uh, in LA and uh, in, in Pasadena where I am. There's a uh, you know large uh, crate and barrel that's being converted to to office space. So um, I'm sure it's gonna you know the, it'll. Uh, you know, depends on the, the needs of the community and the and the market, but uh, yeah, I think the the macro trends and some of those those product types are are going to favor some uh, some changes in use. John, why don't you wrap it? I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think if you look at you know taking it kind of from the micro perspective of Orange County, you know this was already happening. You saw you know the Laguna Hills Mall that's been going you know a large repositioning. Um, uh, play. I think eventually you're going to see the Westminster Mall with something there as well, where you have these large land parcels of retail, you know, centers that just, they don't, there's not a need for them anymore. Um, so I, I do think there's going to be a lot of opportunity on the retail side to reposition those assets. What's traditionally been the, the, the problem is the cities haven't wanted to give up their sales tax revenues from those locations, but I, I think they're, they're losing them anyways, because the tenants are going to go bankrupt and there's going to be vacancy there. So I see that happening. You know, one interesting trend I've heard a couple of people talk about is, um, you know, the, as I mentioned before, the business stay hotels, you know, the extended stay hotels, 
Does the demand drop off to that? Does some of those get converted to apartments? Um, you know, that could be an interesting trend to, to, to watch out for if that's even possible. Um, but again, I, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity uh, on the retail side uh, where just some of these retail centers aren't going to make it and are going to need to get repositioned. Um, and again, thinking about it from an optimistic point of view, if you've been to the Laguna Hills Mall, if you've been to the Westminster Mall, those malls have not been do doing well or providing a lot of value for the communities for many years. So to see those repositioned as something else, uh, I actually think long term is a good thing. And some of this retail just just has needed to be changed. Uh, and I think it could you know, greatly benefit some of these areas, bring more housing, bring better retail, potentially bring new office space. Um, so it, it could be a long term could be a benefit seeing this happen. All right. Thanks, John. All right. So before we conclude, I, I want to thank everyone for participating in our program this morning. I'd like to leave everyone with the following thought, though. So Albert Einstein once said, logic will get you from A to Z and imagination will get you everywhere else. Uh, the psychiatrist had endless curiosity and this quote is a reminder to all of us that we all have huge wells of imagination to draw from and to get us through this pandemic. Um, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel and I don't think it's a train coming at us. <laughs> I, don't. Um, I think that together we can all basically get through this and I think we will get through this and, and we're learning new things. And maybe there's just a little kick in the pants for us to accelerate some of the things that were going on anyways, quite frankly. Not that any of this is good at all, <laughs> But obviously we all learn from this. So I'd like to leave that uh, with you. And then Ed, I don't know if there's anything else you want to follow up with. I'll, no. I want to again, thank all the panelists, you guys for all of this. This was great. And if you want to try you know, to finish it up. Thanks to all the panelists and uh, to Bruce for a very stimulating conversation. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Perfect. Good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks. Thanks.